Good morning, afternoon and evening. I am Dennis Quack and I will be your host today. Welcome to Imagining Educational Futures, a webinar series brought to you by the National Institute of Education, Singapore. The webinar series aims to be different, to engage with some of the most important questions in education, such as what are the purposes of education? What kinds of values should schools teach? Should they even be taught at all? What kinds of persons do we want in society? And what role should education play in it? And what kinds of pedagogical innovations are needed to support teachers in this new educational landscape where character, citizenships, values, and virtues are increasingly contested? The aim of the webinar is to encourage inter, multi, and transdisciplinary thinking to get thought-provoking dialogues going for the purposes of imagining the future of education, especially given that we are facing extreme, unknown, and even improbable futures. The pandemic is a daily reminder nowadays of how unprepared we are and how we have to think hard about how education can help us to get ready. This is the third webinar of the Imagining Educational Future series, and our previous webinars are publicly available on YouTube, and we'll post a link in the chat shortly for you to look at. We encourage you to have a look at it, and when you can, um, as they do discuss the science of learning and Asian cosmopolitanism, important topics of this age. Uh, the topic of today's talk is virtue ethics for character education, current research trends and implication. And this is also relevant for a number of reasons. For those of you who are not from Singapore, welcome. You might like to know that the Singapore government has signaled the importance of character and citizenship education during the Committee of Supply parliamentary debate in 2021. Then Education Minister Lawrence Wong said that if anything, the pandemic has added greater urgency to focus on learning for life through our education system. And character and citizenship education, or CCE for short, is an important but equally challenging curricular area for schools and teachers to engage in. To that end, a new CCE center at the National Institute of Education is being set up to work with schools to strength strengthen CCE learning, conduct relevant research, and provide thought leadership on CCE. The goal of having every teacher to be a CCE teacher is to be realized. Likewise, in NIE, values and ethics has been identified as a key strategic growth area for research and teacher education in the coming years. This signals interest and importance in the area for our topic today. For Singaporeans who are following our, our daily news, uh, there are increasing reports of road rage, even bicycle rage, bullying and antisocial behaviour. These are arguably increasing signs that conflicting values are becoming a new societal fault line in Singapore. The time is now for us to take a serious look into education uh, on for character, citizenship, virtues, ethics, and human flourishing. Today, we are honored to have Professor James Arthur, Professor Kim Sung Moon, and Professor Charlene Tan with us to explore some of the important questions, such as what is the current research on virtue ethics and how can this inform character education in schools? What are the overlaps and differences between traditions of virtue ethics from Eastern and Western philosophies? And what are the various ideals of the flourishing life we can envision and how can educators and policymakers support this in education? Now, before I introduce the first speaker of the day, Please bear with me as I run through with you some of the details for today's session. Um, if you would like to ask a question for our speakers, please submit your questions via the Q&A panel. If you experience um, any technical issues, please try to log out and log back in. Otherwise, please email us at oer.pubs.nie.edu.sg. Uh, we do seek your understanding for some of the questions. Uh, we may not be able to understand, uh, answer them uh, due to time constraints. Uh, please note that the session will be recorded. Now, um, it brings me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, uh, Professor James Arthur. Professor James Arthur is Director of the Jubilee Centre for Character and Virtues and also the Chair of the Society for, uh, for Educational Studies and was Head of the School of Education 2010 to 2015 and Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor 2015 to 2019 at the University of Birmingham. He was previously edit editor of the British Journal of Educational Studies for 10 years and holds numerous honorary titles, including Honorary Professor of the University of Glasgow and Honorary Research Fellow in the University of Oxford. James was made an Officer of the British Empire by the Queen in 2018. 
He has written widely on the relationships between theory and practice in education, particularly the links between character, virtues, citizenship, religion, and education. James established the Jubilee Centre in 2012, and the centre has grown in size, scope, and impact since its launch at the House of Lords in 2012. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor James Arthur to share with us on the topic, how to contextualize character virtues. James? Thank you, Dennis, um, for that very generous introduction. Um, I'd like to begin um, by saying that it was in 2011 that I came to uh, the National Institute, uh, Singapore's National Institute for Education, the, the university, and uh, we launched the uh, character and citizenship uh, curriculum with the Minister of Education. So I was there and gave a, a keynote speech there. I was in, invited by the Ministry of Education uh, at the time. So that was the last time I came uh, to Singapore, I think. But, um, but that was a very, very interesting time. And I believe you've introduced, um, you know, you've amended that character and citizenship uh, curriculum a number of times since then. Um, when we talk about character, uh, especially virtue ethics and character education, there are usually two ways that researchers look at this. The first way is definitions, and they're mainly philosophers. So you get a lot of philosophers who talk about what does character virtues mean, uh, what does it look like, etc., and they tend to do that in the abstract. And then you get social scientists who seem to be concerned with measurement. They're interested in how do we measure character virtues. The trouble is that these two groups of people often don't speak to each other. So the people who are interested in clarifying concepts generally don't speak to the psychologists and the educationalists who are in the classrooms, who are looking at character uh, in, in reality. And that's a shame, but we at the Jubilee Centre try to bring them together through our conferences and through the work that we do. So these are the two main areas of research in character uh, virtue ethics. And um, the other thing about virtue ethics is that lots of people think that it, this is all about the individual, that it's only about the individual, uh, the individual's character. But this is not true because in an Aristotelian, if we follow the teachings of Aristotle, the Greek philosopher from 2,300 years ago, you'll find that he talked about community and society. So the practices that make you a virtuous person, the practices that build your character, are actually embedded in communities. So if your community doesn't flourish, and you don't live in a flourishing community, it's going to be much harder to develop um, a character that will help you flourish. So we need flourishing communities in order for individuals to flourish uh, in society. So it's both community and also the individual. So virtue ethics is sometimes defined as if it's just to do with the individual. That's not true. So virtue ethics, um, when it's seen within character education, has to happen within community because your character doesn't come about um, in a vacuum. So we don't develop our character in a vacuum. We develop it within society, within a community, within a school, within a family. And that's uh, quite important. So I'm going to show you some slides. I'm going to sort of go through these slides very quickly and give you an idea of some of the, uh, the ideas that I would have here. So the centre that I uh, direct is very interested and works along politicians, policymakers, business leaders, researchers. Uh, in other words, we have a very broad audience and we have a very broad engagement. So we don't think that when you're talking about character, we can just talk to academics about that. That, that would be uh, very narrow. Uh, but we have to widen it. We have to talk to practitioners, teachers in schools. We have to talk to professionals. We have to talk to researchers and, of course, policymakers and even politicians. So we involve all of these groups within the research that we conduct within our centre. Next slide. Now, you do know, I'm sure all of you know, that there are different models and definitions of character. 
And I've listed a sum here from my book from 2020, where I went through these historically to sort of understand where some of these models came from. Now, these models that I have here are just a few of the models that you could look at. We're going to hear today um, a model based on Confucius, uh, for example, which I have not really um, dealt with in the models that I've listed here. But I'm very aware that many of the ideas uh, of Aristotle are also the ideas of Confucius as well. So it's very important that we recognize that there's a number of models. And what tends to happen is that these different models tend to overlap with each other. So in any particular society, if you have a character education within schools, you're going to see elements of different models within that character education, because none of them are pure. None of them are exactly a virtue ethics model. None of them are, 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 are you know, a conservative model or a liberal model. None of them are exactly pure. So they tend to be a little bit more of one thing, but then you can see other elements within uh, that model. Next slide. So I want to look at this in terms of five lenses to view character education. So a lens is really a way of seeing things. So how do we see character and what does it mean uh, when we look at it through these particular lenses? So character education can be seen as religious education based on a theology. And that seems to be um, quite important because that is growing. So you get Muslim versions of character education and Muslim ideas of virtue ethics. And that would be the same for Hindus and in India. It would be the same for um, you know, uh, Christians, etc. And there's even uh, Jewish um, models of this as well. So I've seen over the last 10 years a rise in religious models of character virtue ethics. In addition to that, you can see education as good character education. In other words, a good education in a good school results in good character. So the children would know the good, they're introduced to what is good, uh, what the good and, and uh, want to do the good, and, um, uh, and the good simply by being good exemplars in the classroom. In other words, the teachers become exemplars of what the good is uh, in the classroom. And they teach by example, the meaning of right and wrong through a traditional school curriculum. Now, this is very popular in England. So, for example, lots of schools would see themselves as exemplars of character and, and children would come to those schools and they don't have to talk too much about character education as a separate entity. They just simply think that their education provides good character. And this is often emphasised in private education. So a lot of private schools would say that they have good character education. The third way is to see character education as direct instruction and intervention in the curriculum. Singapore has um, a particular curriculum on citizenship and, uh, and character, and this is one way that this model would be seen. Um, it's about explicitly teaching children through a specified curriculum. Now, I have to say that these are just three models here. I'm going to give you another two, but all of them overlap with each other. So you'll find the same ideas in two. So people will talk about the ethos of their school, the atmosphere of their school, helping to create character, where character is caught. Whereas number three is about character that's taught. So one, two is, is about things that you catch from being in a school. Three is about teaching. Next slide. So the fourth one is seeing character education as character development. This is much more psychological. It's the use of classroom behavior strategies to change behavior. It's about counseling, classroom management, working with parents, building social skills, nudging people to, to make them do certain things. And this is much more of a psychological approach. Sometimes it's just pure behaviorism changing the behavior of young people. And this is the area where there's a great deal of research. 
So this area has a huge amount of research in it. This is predominantly the area that people will do most of their research, especially social scientists and psychologists. Now, number five is seeing character education as service learning outside of the classroom, connecting with the community, engaging actively. This type of service learning is that you develop character by being engaged in your community, by going to do uh, voluntary work, etc. And this will build your character of being a good citizen. Now, I would say that all five of them have, uh, have use and all five of them you could probably find in most schools in some form or other. But in most schools, one or two of these will predominate. One or two will become the most important ideas. Next slide. However, there's a great deal of criticism of this, especially from conservatives. A lot of conservative politicians in America are very suspicious of um, this type of character education, especially the psychological character education, because they think it's all about psychologically <clears throat> and emotionally manipulating children in order to push a certain political agenda. So they think it's more left-wing politics. They would call it social engineering, where you actually try to socially engineer children to behave um, the way that the state would like them to behave. Next slide. <clears throat> Now, in the West, I've written a book, it was in 2000, it's over 22 years ago, I wrote this little book, The Communitarian Agenda in Education. And I recognised then that there was a movement towards character education more widely in the West at this time. The family, I, I wrote, should be the primary moral educator of children. So I wanted to emphasise that ultimately it's parents who are responsible for their children. Teachers are only, in a secondary sense, responsible for the children that they teach. It's their parents who are the primary moral educators, with teachers being the secondary or the second stage of moral education. But it's parents and the family um, that are the most important. Character education includes the systematic teaching of virtues in schools. So character education has to include some teaching of the virtues in schools, you know, so that children could actually, can actually decide what type of person they should be. You know, what do they commit themselves to? What values do they wish to, to see themselves as holding? And how do they link with the society in which they live? The third one is the ethos of the community as an educative function in school life. Everyone knows that every school has an, an ethos, it has an atmosphere, it has a climate, as we would say, and that is created by the leadership in the schools. It's created by every teacher, and it's actually created by the students as well, the types of students who come to that school. They'll create the ethos of the school, and that ethos is very important because it's through that ethos that children will learn and pick up uh, ideas about character, ideas about who they should become as well. Next slide. Community service is also an important part of a child's education, of working in the community, of encouraging children to do charitable work, to volunteer, hugely important. Number five is schools should provide an active understanding of the common good. That simply means that schools should have an idea of what is good for society, what is good for the individual in society. I believe that in the West, we have a huge problem of mental health issues. Lots of people are claiming that they're stressed, um, et cetera, and that they, they can't function in society. This is often because they don't have any sense of meaning and purpose. They don't feel that they have a purpose in life. They don't feel that life gives them meaning. So I think character virtues help children and help students have a better understanding of who they are and helps them to embed in themselves a better understanding of meaning and purpose so that they can go forward in life with a clear idea of what they ought to do, what, how they should be engaged. And I also found that religious schools are more effective at understanding and teaching these five themes. They seem to have a better understanding of these themes 
and that they, and it doesn't matter what religion, by the way, it could be any religion, but religion in general tends to um, bring things together much more clearly. Next slide. So in the video you just saw, um, it talked about what are the aims of education. I would say the aims of education aim to form people so they can live well in a world worth living in. So people have to feel that the world that they live in is worth living in, and they have to be able to live well. You can only live well if you have purpose and meaning in life. The goals of human life, therefore, is to develop its essential excellencies, the potentialities that define and constitute it. So I would say that every child, every student can learn and can be educated, and every student has excellencies within them they have to be brought out. And it's the role of the teacher to bring these essential excellencies within the individual out. And these potentialities, in other words, every child, every uh, student will have certain potentials within themselves. And these will help define and constitute who they are. It will help define who that person is. And this is, again, all about meaning and purpose uh, in life. So that's what I would say were the most important um, areas in life where you, you, you begin to sort of talk about these. So I would say that these are really the areas that we should be focused on in terms of research. Now, it's very difficult in research because people want to quantify things. You know, we have the questionnaires. We're not really quantifying much there because questionnaires are really looking at perceptions. What are the perceptions of teachers? But they also sometimes try to measure character and character virtues. And this is extremely difficult to do. It's very difficult to quantify that. Um, I actually um, was at Buckingham Palace. I met um, Her Majesty the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, um, when she gave me this uh, medal, uh, when she made me an officer of the British Empire, which is quite funny. But, um, but when I went there, she actually asked me the question, how does one measure character? And I thought that was a very popular, it's a sort of question that many teachers ask me, how do we measure it? Because lots of teachers are always obsessed by, we have to measure this, we have to quantify it, we have to write it down, we have to give a grade for it. And the Queen asked me, how does one measure character? And I gave a very flippant answer, because we only had a few moments with her. And I simply said to her, Your Majesty, one doesn't measure character, one recognises it. And um, she smiled, she thought that was funny. But actually, afterwards, I thought, this is not so funny. This is absolutely true. Because think of the professional judgment of teachers. Teachers spend 20, 30, 40 years teaching children. And yet we downplay their professional judgment. Teachers gain a great deal of wisdom, a lot of practical wisdom in dealing with children. They understand children. They know what their needs are. They can anticipate their development. They can work with them and teach them and give them new ideas, liberate them. And yet we don't give much credit to teachers in terms of their professional judgment. We want to measure everything and put it onto a graph, almost like a business statement at the end of the year and tell everyone, you know, we've improved our grades by 3% this year, or we've increased attainment by this. Now, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, of course, Good education results in um, good qualifications and people are educated. But what's important is that we should emphasize more professional judgment. And this is what the Jubilee Center is concentrating on in terms of research at the moment. We call it phronesis, which is what Aristotle called it. It's called practical wisdom. You can call it prudence. You can call it good sense. It's the good sense of the teacher, you know, the wisdom of the teacher making decisions about children and helping them develop. And this is what really we are um, about in the Jubilee Center in terms of our research at the moment. And I think that's uh, absolutely key. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor James Arthur, for that um, wonderful presentation. Um, we, 
should probably invite you to Singapore and uh, the education minister is definitely going to be asking you the same question the Queen asked you, how do you measure character? And and I'll be curious to see what the response, if you were to give the same response to, to the minister as well one day. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Professor Kim Sung Moon, uh, who will be sharing with us on the topic uh, virtue, dignity and the rule of law, a Confucian perspective. Uh, Professor Kim is from the Department of Public Policy at City University of Hong Kong, uh, where he also serves as Associate Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences and the Director of the Center for East Asian and Comparative Philosophy. As a political theorist, uh, Kim's research interest includes Confucian democratic and constitutional theory, comparative political theory, and history of East Asian political thought. And he published four books in these areas, Confucian Democracy in East Asia, Public Reason Confucianism um, by Cambridge University Press, Democracy After Virtue by Oxford University Press and Theorizing Confucian Virtue Politics, uh, The Political Philosophy of Mencius and Sunzi uh, by Cambridge University Press more recently. Um, over to you, Professor Kim. Thank you, Dennis, for very generous introduction. Okay, I'm really uh, honored to be part of this great uh, webinar symposium. And I've been to Singapore many times and unfortunately because of this pandemic situation i'm prevented from visiting you guys and uh, friends of mine so it's uh, it's uh, i regret that i cannot be there with you physically but it's uh, my great pleasure to share my idea with all of you uh by training and by research interest i'm not education scholar and i'm political theorist who is interested in democratic and uh, constitutional theory in the East Asian context uh, with a special focus on Confucianism. And several years ago, about seven or eight years ago, I was invited by uh, National University of Singapore and with uh, several of my friends who attended this uh, uh, big lecture, public lecture entitled, Can Confucianism Save the World? Uh, it was, I, I was not the main speaker and I participated in the uh, subsequent uh, academic conference, but uh, I found the whole, the title of the event um, amusing and hilarious because I mean, even if I'm the scholar of Confucianism, and although I do a, a lot of other things, but I, I always, I've been always thinking that only if Confucian can save my family, then that would be just fine. But anyhow, so, uh, so <clears throat> I've been thinking about Confucianism in the context of democracy and political meritocracy, what kind of political institutions we might want to build or rebuild in our society of Confucian heritage, what kind of uh, virtues we can inculcate uh, in ourselves, our children and us as citizens in order to be uh, living a flourishing moral and political life and those issues. So uh, today's talk, I, I will share uh, some of my ideas with you, but and, and toward the end of my presentation, I will see what kind of implication we can draw from uh, political reflections on virtue and virtue ethics. And, and as you can see, my title, Virtue, Dignity, and Rule of Law, many virtue ethicists uh, do not want to associate themselves with the idea of rights and law because they tend to think law and rights are basically the territory of the ontologist. So virtue ethics is about basically character formation or character building, situation-specific, context-specific, uh, not the kind of a top-down uh, morality that can lay down the institutional foundation. But in this presentation, I want to build the connection between uh, character on the one hand and, and rights and rule of law on the other. So many of us uh, who, who uh, the East Asians, but well, the, the people outside East Asia also are familiar with the names like uh, at least Confucius and Mencius. And Mencius is one of the most important ancient Confucian masters after Confucius, uh, famous for his uh, notion that human nature is originally good. But amongst the philosophers and, and political theorists, there are debate about what it means to be originally good. What, how can we make sense of a mentious account of human nature as good? So there are a variety of interpretations. And some people are tempted to interpret Mencius' idea from the ontological perspective, but uh, this is how I cash out Mencius' idea. So Mencius said, in my interpretation, Mencius argued that humans have 
the sprout, 또한, of virtue, as innate moral sentiment, potential. So the sprouts include like a feeling of a pity of compassion as the sprout of benevolence, ren, and a feeling of uh, modesty as a sprout of right, the, 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 the ritual propriety. So basically, a uh, mangshas uh, presents four cardinal virtues and, and accordingly four sprouts of virtue as innate moral potential. Because, because these moral potential tend to uh, incline us toward the moral goodness, he argues that human nature is originally good. It's not that we're going to be automatically doing uh, good things without any education, but because of the innate moral potential or sentiment, we are predisposed to do good thing unless some external factors interfere in our lives. So realization of uh, moral potential, thus defined, produces a formidable moral character. And formation of a formidable moral character requires an arduous process of moral self-cultivation. So Meng just uses uh, many agricultural examples, right? And then we take care of our otherwise feeble moral sprouts. And then when we nourish our sprouts of morality, then it can grow. And then if we are somehow able to successfully grow our moral sprouts, then our character will be uh, formidable. And then we can... Uh, uh, we can do good things without uh, really intending uh, to achieve those good things. So moral self-cultivation, literally, it's a, it's a, it's a the Meng just using agricultural metaphor, is internally motivated because we have those moral sprouts that predispose us toward the goodness. So virtue, understood as stable character traits, resulting from moral self-cultivation, resulting Deepest joy and happiness. This is important thing. It, it, when you do moral, when you engage in moral behaviors, then it creates joy and happiness that, that drives us to do, continue to do a good thing. So making the virtue itself valuable for its own sake. Therefore, finally, a, a person of a formidable character lives a flourishing moral life, you know, what's, whatever situation she finds herself. So we see here the big debate in philosophy and psychology between virtue ethics or moral connoisseurship on the one hand and situationism on the other hand. Then we can drive two interesting accounts of human dignity. One is uh, dignity understood as achievement. So dignity can be understood as outcome of a painstaking process of moral self cultivation So those who are familiar with the Confucian tradition, we have this uh, uh, idea called Junzi. We call those, th those who have morally cultivated them, junji, moral gentlemen or gentlewoman, on the one hand, and those who have failed to develop their moral development despite their possession of uh, innate moral sentiments, we call them shawren or uh, petty men or little men. Okay? So only those, the junji, are in, uh, possess, according to this account, possess dignity. So shawren doesn't have dignity, and only uh, junji have dignity. So this is one way to understand the human dignity in the Confucian tradition. But on the other hand, uh, Mengxia's uh, begins with innate moral potential that is shared by everyone, regardless of what our gender and class differences. So um, we universally, according to Mengxia, share human nature, character traits, and moral potential. And Mengxia, as I said, uh, presents four sprouts, feeling of pity and compassion, as a sprout of benevolence, feeling of shame and aversion, as a sprout of righteousness, feeling of modesty and compliance, as a feeling of right, uh, the ritual propriety, and a sense of right and wrong as a, 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 the sprout of wisdom. So these things are born with, right? So Meng famous famously argues that everybody can become a sage like Yao and Shun, the legendary sage kings in Chinese, of Chinese antiquity, everybody basically, because of uh, possession of this innate uh, moral potential. So we have two contrasting accounts of human account, uh, dignity as achievement, and which uh, supports uh, political meritocracy. Many advocates of Confucian political meritocracy in this stage and beyond are premising their argument on this account of human dignity as achievement. And only those who are qualified can participate in decision-making process of becoming public officials. And second, dignity as potential, and many uh, Confucian democrats who argue for constitutional democracy basing their idea of human dignity on, on the second account. So we can have two competing accounts of 
dignity and, and correspondingly can have two different accounts of or ideas of political regimes. What about Sunji? Sunji is known for his idea that human nature is bad in the sense that we lack those innate moral sprouts. So therefore, Sunji, Sunji only supports a human dignity as achievement. So, and he wants to achieve a congruence between moral meritocracy or moral inequality between Junji and Xiaoren on the one hand, and political meritocracy. Only those who are qualified, only those who have successfully cultivated their moral character should be entitled to uh, take a part in the governance. So this is the so-called Confucian political meritocracy and many contemporary Confucians, including Jiang Jing and Daniel Bell, Bai Tongdong in Shanghai, Fan Weiping, my colleague here, and Joseph Chen, many a prominent contemporary Confucians advocate Confucian political meritocracy based on this idea of human dignity as achievement. And, 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 and based on that, they uh, argue for what they call uh, service conception of political right. I mean, it has long list, but then you can see the last point, the more one makes a contribution to the well-being of others, the more he or she is entitled to political rights. So political rights are not natural rights. Political rights should be dis distributed, distributed based on the level of our virtue. So more virtuous person, Junji, is entitled to more political rights and less virtuous person are entitled to less political rights. So right to vote, for instance, is given only to Junji, morally cultivated person. So right to vote is not, like one person on vote is not uh, endorsed based on this idea of human dignity achievement or service conception of political rights. Only those who have served the well-being of others are entitled to possess political rights because political rights like uh, power is something that we can acquire rather than something that is given to us. And that can lend support to what they call Singaporean model, maybe arguably, and or the China model, okay, in contradistinction to Western style liberal democracy. So they reject political equality based on uh, one person, one vote, and popular sovereignty, and popular right to political participation, okay? Because only uh, virtuous and knowledgeable elites are entitled to make a public decisions. So far, so good. But how, how can we make sense of these two accounts of human dignity from constitutional and legal perspective? The political structure undergirded by service conception of a right, uh, political rights, uh, so uh, is uh, inconsistent with, uh, is not a constitutional democracy in which political equality is derived from natural moral equality and which relies on one person on vote as the institutional expression of a political equality and popular sovereignty. So many advocates of a Confucian meritocracy support so-called meritocratic upper house. They come up with by cameralism, we have a upper house consisting of so-called uh, virtuous, knowledgeable political elites who are path, who passed uh, some sort of examination, like a civil examination that we used to have in Song Dynasty, Ming Dynasty. Then we have a low house, democratic low house consisting of democratic elected members. But then upper house, meritocratic upper house has uh, more power when it comes to, or well, veto power when it comes to gridlock, tension, disagreement, or conflict between these two houses. Then, second, uh, this conception rejects uh, core democratic principles as I just discussed, and this rejection renders the purpose of a separation of powers, independent judiciary in particular, helplessly ambiguous, right? If only, the, if Junzi, only those morally cultivated are supposed to govern people, then they should be at the legislature, right? Upper house, military upper house, but also they should be in control of the executive. And at the same time, they should be in control of the judiciary. That's exactly what happened in pre-modern China, right? Pre-modern China, the bureaucracy didn't have separation of powers because those who passed the civil examination occupied all those uh, positions undivided uh, institutionally, right? So if human dignity is understood in meritocratic terms, and thus the intrinsic value of natural moral equality is rejected along with the political equality, on what ground, we should ask, can it be claimed that coercive political power ought to be 
justify to citizens, especially if you think about criminal justice. You are supposed to have uh, committed a crime, then you are put into jail, right? And the government is basically punishing you. But government, when government is punishing you, uh, its course of political power or legal authority should be justified to us who are now being punished, right? Mainly in the court. But if, if political power and right is disproportionately distributed, and only those who have so-called uh, possessing a moral virtue and, and knowledge are entitled to make uh, important public decisions. Why not? We discriminated between the citizens depending on their level of virtue when it comes to uh, their criminal punishment or, or their exercise of basic uh, human civil political rights. So without passing moral equality uh, and the intrinsic value of human uh, public standing, it is impossible to make sure that court justifiability tests be equally available for all citizens regardless of their virtue. Okay, so virtue ethicists uh, in, in the Confucian, uh, in contemporary Confucianism, mainly focus on who is entitled to govern the people. But when we flip their argument, upside down, it raised lots of question about how, why the state or government should uh, be uh, accountable when it comes to uh, its exercise of a uh, criminal uh, uh, coercive power uh, when citizens have committed a crime, why citizens have equal right to be protected by uh, law. That uh, creates uh, lots of lots of questions uh, if we follow the human dignity as achievement. But then, but then uh, Sunji makes very very interesting claim, which is uh, uh, normally dismissed by many uh, scholars of uh, Confucianism. And then I I'd like to draw attention to highlight a, a part where Sunji says something like this. This Sunji explains the origin of a ritual or origin of a civil government in this way: if strong threaten the weak. If the wise terrorize the ignorant, if people below destroy their spirits, if the young bully their elders, if this, if it's like this, then the old and the weak will face the worry of losing their means of nurture, and those in their prime will face the disaster of a divisive struggle. So, Sunji's concern is not only to uh, bring about order and, and establish a political and moral hierarchy. On the other hand, and more importantly, I believe, he is profoundly, he was profoundly concerned with the, the condition of justice where the weak women, the weak people, the ignorant women can be pre pre uh, prevented from being exploited by those who, who possess power, okay? Regardless of their level of virtue. This, uh, this dignity, according to Sunji, is open to everyone. They, that's the whole reason why we have civil government in order to protect, again, in order to protect the well-being and dignity of the people, including the least, uh, the least advantaged members of our society. Then Sunji talks about remedy. So if load is the boat, the common people are the water. The water can support the bo bo boat, which is the focus of a Confucian meritocrat, but water can also overturn the boat. If ruler or government fails to protect well-being of the people, again, including the worst of our, of our society, then people have power or right to return the state or change the ruler. So here we can drive two foundational uh, rights of uh, Confucian constitutional democracy. In pluralist society that we find ourselves in, the conception of a common good on each our uh, service conception is dependent. Our, our conception of common good is subject to moral disagreement. And under the circumstances of moral disagreement, no one has a prima facie moral or political right to deny the right to political participation to the people who are subject to law and public policy that are supposed to be made for the protection and promotion of their own well-being. Nor does anyone have the supreme political authority to deny the right to political protect, right to equal protection of basic civil and political rights 
to the people, regardless of their virtue, whose basic interest can always be encroached upon by the coercible power of the state exercised in mediation of law. So finally, what implication we can drive from the discussion so far for education? So I would suggest that, I would make two suggestions. First of all, I don't deny the importance of human dignity as achievement, which is, I believe this is extremely important insight that we can glean from Confucian tradition, but we won't use this idea of human dignity or virtue ethics when it comes to our private ethics. We want to encourage our students, our citizens to cultivate good moral character and, and become good as a private individual. And there is no problem with it. But when it comes to political and civic uh, engagement, we want to encourage and help students and citizens to acknowledge the fundamental moral worth of people and their equal legal and political rights, regardless of gender, ethnicity, race, education, and social class. So we want to encourage our citizens to cultivate civic virtue that can help them uh, can, uh, you know, take care of the well-being of the worst of, of our society. And then so we can uh, drive these political ethics from uh, the Confucian account of uh, human dignity as a moral potential. So both accounts of human dignity are relevant, important, but when it comes to our political education, I think it is more uh, pertinent for us to pay attention to or more attention to Confucian dignity as moral foundation rather than Confucian dignity as achievement. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. Kim, for your very interesting talk uh, that looks at the intersection between virtues and the rule of law. Um, our, our next speaker is uh, Professor Charlene Tan, um, also from Hong Kong, uh, who will be sharing with us on the topic uh, virtue ethics in education, the example of a respectful junzi. Uh, Professor Ch Charlene Tan from the Faculty of Education, University of Hong Kong, uh, was born and raised in Singapore, and she has over two decades of teaching experience as a school teacher and teacher educator in Singapore. She is the author of Confucius uh, by Bloomsbury Press, Confucian Philosophy for Contemporary Education uh, by Routledge, and Mindful Education Insights from Confucian and Christian Traditions by Springer. Uh, her current research interests includes ethics in Chinese philosophy, virtue and leadership, as well as moral education. Charlene, over to you. Thank you very much, Dennis, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak at this webinar. Um, the title of my presentation is Virtue Ethics in Education, the Example of a Respectful Jin Zi. So for, for my presentation, I'll be covering these three topics. First, I'll explain the relationship between Confucianism and virtue ethics. Next, I will focus on the Confucian ideal of a respectful Jin Zi. Jin Zi means exemplary person. I noticed that Professor Kim just now translates it as morally developed person, which is, means the same thing. Finally, I will highlight uh, the key implications of Confucian ethics for values education. So let's start with the first topic, the relationship between Confucianism and virtue ethics. And to do so, let's watch a video clip. This is about Confucius saving the life of a slave boy. Now, I'm not sure how accurate um, this uh, incident is, historically, but the video clip is helpful to illustrate the character and teachings of Confucius. As you watch, uh, I invite you to think of the possible reasons for Confucius to want to save the slave boy. Uh, and also, I'm sorry, I can't find the English version it's in Chinese, but there are English subtitles. So let's watch. Kong 胆子也太大了吧 
。你人陪葬原是古礼，你不是一直主张恢复古礼的吗？大司徒，仁者爱人，以礼杀人则非礼也。叔孙大夫，你能仁慈的对待一只雄雉，秋拜请你，也为这个已失去胳膊的小奴讲几句话吧。我们今天谈的只是关于冬季之治的问题，这与人训之礼无关。错，大有关系。《礼经》说：“天地间人为贵，用活人殉葬是残忍的陋俗。”本朝自文武周公以来，早已废止。我鲁国乃周公故礼，礼仪之邦，我们理应变古改制，推陈出新。对，君上。各位大夫，孔丘在此，冒死请求你们，赦免了这个小奴吧。赦免了他吧。赦免了他。不要！孔丘，季平子大人临终前有遗言，要求以生前所爱者为训，让这小奴殉葬，并非残忍。反而正是体现大司徒对父亲的孝心和爱心啊！公山大夫，秋知道，大人作为家臣侍奉平子大夫多年，秋还听说，借平子大夫生前常说，他是离不开你的。对呀、啊，没错。既然你们如此情深意厚，他老人家在九泉之下，又岂能少了你的陪伴呢？如果大人愿陪平子大夫同行，那秋就赞成让这个小奴随你殉葬。你给个话啊！你你荒谬！看来大夫并不愿意做这个陪葬者，那么己所不欲，勿施于人。君上，微臣的话讲完了。居然父子言之凿凿，我看何意，就放了他吧So, what do you think are some possible reasons for Confucius to want to save the slave boy? Now, I can think of at least four reasons. First, Confucius could be thinking about the consequences. He may think we need to stop the practice of slave burial for the good of everyone. Such a practice is barbaric. It causes fear, hatred, division in society. Or Confucius could be thinking from the perspective of the action itself. He may think. Killing the boy who has done no wrong is cruel and unfair to him. Or Confucius could be feeling sorry for the boy; he has、uh, this sympathy and pity for him and wants to help him. Now, all of the above are plausible reasons, but the main reason for Confucius to want to save the slave boy is this: this is consistent with Confucius being a gentle and exemplary person. His reasoning about the consequence, the action, the motive, all reflect his moral character, his virtues, and this is essentially what virtue ethics is about. Now, virtue ethics is not so much concerned with this question, "What shall I do?" Rather, it is more interested in this question, "What sort of person should I be?" In other words, virtue ethics focuses on the character of the person rather than the person's actions or duties alone. The word virtue in Greek, arati, refers to a trait of character that is to be admired and desired because it is the constituent of human excellence. Typical examples of virtues are generosity, compassion, integrity, courage, and so on. Now, in the West, the most famous philosopher and proponent of virtue ethics is Aristotle, and Professor Arthur has already mentioned Aristotelian ethics earlier on. But in Asia, I think we are more familiar with an Eastern counterpart, Confucius. 
Now, Confucius teaches that the ideal human person is a jin zi, an exemplary person, or what Professor Kim just now says, morally developed person. So such a person stands out for his or her moral character rather than simply the person's action, the consequence arising from the action or the motive. Now, there are many virtues associated with a jin zi, but because of time constraints, I shall only focus on one virtue, respect, jing. So this brings me to the second topic of my presentation, the Confucian ideal of a respectful jin zi. There are three key aspects of the respectful jin zi. The jin zi's motivation for respect, basis of respect, and the recipients of respect. First, the jin zi is motivated to be respectful because this is essential for moral self-cultivation. In the Analects Lun Yu, which records the teachings of Confucius, a disciple wanted to learn more about the jin zi. Confucius said, such a person cultivates oneself by being respectful. Confucian respect is this constant, wholehearted, appreciative attentiveness, whether to the self, others, things, or events. Respect is necessary for anyone who wants to learn more, practice, and ultimately become a jin zi through moral self-cultivation. Now, a basis of respect is empathy. In another passage of Analex, Confucius teaches that we should be respectful all the time, wherever, wherever we are. Whether we are abroad or at a workplace, we should show respect to everyone, treating them as important guests, as if you're officiating at an important function, such as today, okay, this webinar. Why? Because of empathy. Do not impose on others what you yourself do not desire. Or to put it positively, do unto others what you want others to do unto you. Respect others because you want others to respect you. And we saw that in the video clip just now, when Confucius questioned the official who wanted to bury the slave boy alive, whether he was prepared to do the same on himself, to give up his own life for his master. Finally, the Qin Zi is respectful towards everyone without exception. And this is mentioned in this passage, the Qin Zi is respectful, deferential and courteous towards people in general. And we saw that too in the video clip when Confucius showed respect to the slave boy whose life was worth nothing in ancient China, but whose life was precious to Confucius. So respect uh, begins at home. And that's what Professor Arthur mentioned just now as well, that virtue ethics is not just about individualism, it's also about the community. And it starts at home. So respect begins at home, where a child learns to show respect to one's parents and siblings, and thereafter extends the respect to people in the community and finally the whole world. Now, thus far, I've covered the relationship between Confucianism and virtue ethics and the Confucian ideal of a respectful jinzi. The last part of my presentation, I would like to suggest two implications of Confucian ethics for values education. First, values education should focus on character development, a point that Professor Arthur mentioned just now about character development. Now here, I'm not saying that consequence, action, motive are not important. It's not about choosing one quadrant, character, and ignore the other three. Rather, it's like this. It's putting character at the heart of values education. It's about helping all students to become jinzi, people with moral character. Because only then, I believe, will all students be able to choose the most appropriate action with the right motive that leads to the best possible consequence. But how to begin to develop the character of the students, you may ask? Well, this brings us back to the notion of the respectful jin zi. So this is my second implication, my suggestion. That values education should begin with uh, inculcating respect in all students for them to have this constant, wholehearted, appreciative attentiveness. 
for them to be motivated to show respect for everyone based on empathy. And schools can do so in various ways. I suggest three ways. Number one, schools can use real life case studies. Uh, the Singaporean teachers here will be familiar with this example. Recent one, this Singaporean undergraduate was beaten up in London and was told, we don't want your coronavirus in our country. But he was not infected with the virus, by the way, and he was uh, attacked purely because of his Chinese appearance. So I suggest teachers can use this as a case study and get students to explore how respect is essential to overcome racism. The second method is role play. Uh, through role play, we can get students to learn about, to learn how respect is based on empathy. And I suggest that it's important to develop different facets of empathy in our students. Cognitive empathy, where you see things from the other person's point of view. Effective empathy, where you feel how the other person feels. Physical empathy, where you experience, for example, what it's like to be visually impaired. And finally, empathic concern, where you're motivated to do good, to care for another person. The third teaching method is service learning, something that Professor uh, Arthur mentioned just now. And I know that service learning is increasingly common in schools, and that's great, where students are involved in various community projects. But I would um, stress that it's important for students not to engage in service learning by going through the motion as a to-do list, but for students to serve others with and through a deep sense of respect and thereafter to reflect on their service experience and to ask themselves how they have grown as jinzi, as people of moral character. I've come to the end of my presentation. I started by explaining that Confucianism is an Eastern example of virtue ethics, where the focus is not so much on what should I do, but on what sort of person should I be. Next, I explain the Confucian concept of the respectful jinzi, an exemplary person who shows respect to all, with no exception, based on empathy. Finally, I highlight two key implications of Confucian ethics for values education, that character development should be at the center of values education. And to do so, we need to begin with respect. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof Tan, uh, for your fantastic presentation. Uh, we will now respectfully like to switch over to our moderator for the panel discussion, uh, Associate Professor Suzanne Chu. Uh, Suzanne is an Associate Professor in the English Language and Literature Academic Group at the National Institute of Education. Uh, her research has been published in various peer-reviewed journals such as the Harvard Education Review, uh, Research in the Teaching of Edu English, Discourse, Studies in the Cultural Politics of Education, among others. Her book, Reading the World, the Globe and the Cosmos, published by Peter Lang, uh, was awarded the Critics' Choice Book Award by the American Educational Studies Association. Her most recent books are co-edited volumes titled Educating for the 21st Century, Perspectives, Policies and Practices from Around the World by Springer, and Literature Education in the Asia-Pacific, Policies and Practices and Perspectives in Global Times by Routledge. She recently published a book titled Teaching Literature Through Ethics, The Significance of Ethical Criticism in a Global Age by Routledge as well. Suzanne, please, may I also invite all the speakers to switch on your videos uh, for this particular discussion. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon and uh, good morning to everyone, those of you who are overseas. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, very heartened to hear that uh, all our speakers today have uh, in some way or another been to Singapore or even grew up in Singapore, um, we hope to invite you and see you in person someday. Okay, um, so I'd like to turn our attention back to this webinar's uh, topic, which is Virtues Education, Virtue Ethics for Character Education. Now, this title may uh, lead one to question, you know, um, you know, whether virtue ethics should be instrumentally used for character education. 
That is, should the aim of character education be to cultivate certain desired, idealized virtues? Uh, is there a danger when virtue education becomes indoctrination or kind of ideological colonization? Or perhaps we should actually reverse the title and say it's uh, character education for virtue ethics. In other words, virtue ethics becomes an end in itself, right, rather than a means. Um, and this kind of uh, goes against the consequentialist approach to virtue ethics. So uh, this also raises a few questions. Um, and I think today's talk, we heard from three different speakers. Uh, Professor Arthur, I think he mentioned the overlaps between Aristotelian and Confucian traditions of virtue ethics. One question I have too is whether, uh, you know, despite the emphasis on community in both, there might also be subtle distinctions. I think it's often said by scholars that the Confucian idea of eudaimonia or human flourishing has a more expensive idea or cosmopolitan idea, which is that uh, it's not about the flourishing of the self, but the how the self is responsible for the flourishing of all others, uh, starting from his community and then the world at large. Uh, Professor Kim's talk um, brought to mind a very important uh, connection between ethics and politics, because so often in character education, we are very consumed by moral behavior and moral development. And so the question is, how do we uh, instill what he calls civ civic virtues how do we introduce or get students to engage with even politics, uh, especially in East Asian countries when this might be sensitive? Uh, Professor Tan, she talked about uh, the jinzi, the respectful jinzi. And I think this whole idea of um, you know, cultivating moral character at the heart of uh, character education. The question too is that um, at what point can certain virtues that we deem positive become harmful. So for example, the emphasis on respect, uh, might it also degenerate into submissiveness and conformity? Um, just like the virtue of justice, which uh, Aristotle said in Nicomachean Ethics, right, is the most superior of virtues. Now, uh, we also see justice becoming, descending into online vigilantism and, and violence today. So virtues that in the form of this can descend into something um, extreme. So maybe we need uh, pronesis or, or practical wisdom is what we need. So I think these are all very exciting and provocative ideas. And I think we have several questions um, for our panelists today. We will start with uh, Professor Arthur. There's a question um, about whether it is important for our students uh, who are young adults at university to be able to recognize their own character achieved and developing? And can we develop their evaluative judgment in this? Professor Arthur, any responses to this question? Um, yes, I think we can uh, develop the character of students in, in high schools, in universities, in the professions. Young people join in the various professions. Um, young people uh, need that character to be developed. Um, it's something that I think every student has a right to. Now, we live in a society where there are signs uh, where um, students can be quite unethical. So we have plagiarism in universities. We have, um, we have sometimes students who don't recognise the ethical in the ethical. They don't recognise that these are ethical uh, situations. And I think they get that sometimes from society, from the media, sometimes from uh, their parents, um, the sometimes dysfunctionality in the family. Sometimes schools perhaps don't do enough in this area. But it's not good enough for universities just to impart information. Universities are not there just to educate if it's just about providing information for students. They must help students transform themselves as well. It's, education is about transformation. It's about students becoming, uh, I would say, who they ought to become, in a sense, and, and, and deciding themselves. So they're free to decide themselves what type of person they become, what commitments they will make in life. So it's very important that universities give students the ability and opportunities to think about these things, to reflect on them. So 
in the curriculum, in the university life, in extracurricular activities. These are the types of things that help students uh, develop and to build the character that they want to commit themselves to. So universities have a very important role um, to develop, help develop students. They have to provide opportunities and space and also time. They mustn't cram the curriculum so much that students don't have any time for reflection. You know, it's not about just cramming information into their heads. It's about giving students the opportunity to liberate themselves. So true education is when the students actually educate themselves. They, 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 they lead on the learning. They become the learners themselves. Um, the teachers are there to facilitate the learning, but the students themselves have to do that deep understanding, that deep reflection. And they should be encouraged to do that um, in and out of the classroom. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think this extends not just to universities, right, but to schools as yeah. well. I mean, giving students the space to or empowering them to really uh, construct values and even think about what values are important for their own flourishing. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and the panelists, the rest of the panelists, feel free to respond as well. We have a question for uh, Prof Tan. Okay, um, you showed a framework earlier. Uh, there's a question about isn't, uh, um, okay, I'm trying to interpret this, um, but the idea that action and character are interconnected. So they are not, sh shouldn't be seen as uh, discrete, but the expected behavior flows as a consequence of someone's actions. Yeah, that's right. So thank you for the question. Um, because it, and it allows me to clarify. So the point is not that action or consequences or even motive are not important because we all know they are important. But for virtue ethics of which Confucianism is an example of, uh, it's a question of where do you start? So a jin, you start with a jin. A jin is one who performs moral actions, not the other way around. The performance of moral actions does not make you a jin. So likewise, a jin is one who performs an action that will lead to the best possible outcomes. Um, it may not be the best outcome, it may not be the only outcome, but the best possible outcomes given that situation, but not the other way around. Just because you have a so-called good or right consequence doesn't make you, doesn't make the person who performs it a jin. So I, when I, uh, I introduced that model, character development is at the heart, is at the center, but but the action, consequence, and motive are important. So, so that is number one. It's a matter of emphasis. It's not either or. And also, that relates to what um, Suzanne just now uh, raised about respect. Uh, we cannot stand on its own, right? Because if all you have is respect, then you may like, uh, lapse into the idea that, okay, respect. A respectful act is ABC, respectful consequences XYZ. I mean, then that's not virtue ethics. So it's back to the idea of, yes, you mentioned about practical wisdom. And actually, there's a Confucian notion. It's called Yi. So Yi is what is right or what is appropriate. It involves judgment, practical uh, uh, wisdom, applied knowledge, as well as run. Run means you love others. So it, it's, a, it's a whole back of virtues, which I don't have the time to address. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the whole back of virtues is like a, a kind of ecosystem that we, uh, and I remember uh, Tu Wei Ming, he talked about how this, he used the metaphor, we are journeying with others, uh, you know, in, in this, we're not alone in, in this cultivation of virtue, but it's journey, it's a journey with other people in, in this moral cultivation. So it's this community idea and this ecosystem. So very interesting. Um, I'd like to turn to uh, Professor Kim now, a question about, I mean, you write, you, you talk a lot about the idea of um, the, the, ethic, the ethical and the political. Um, and I'm very interested in this idea of the public sphere, the critical public sphere, and how it shouldn't be seen as something out there, but how in schools we can also think about preparing our students for participatory democracy even in East Asian countries. So 
one of the things that doesn't quite uh, get spoken a lot about is the pedagogy, meaning um, what are the pedagogies that teachers should think about um, infusing that can actually empower students um, to participate as citizens um, and to apply civic virtues, um, you know, so that when they graduate from school, um, they, they will become like informed uh, citizens, you know, uh, critical citizens. What are the kinds of analytical skills, the kinds of participatory democracy capacities that we need in today's world? Uh, Prof Professor Kim? Yeah, that's, a, that's a challenging question, I, I must say. Uh, <clears throat> it, it, it is extremely important for us citizens, including, of course, our young generation to understand that uh, the gist of uh, moral self-cultivation lies in uh, transforming ourselves from private individuals who are pre preoccupied with uh, my things, right? My my life, my happiness, my property, my, 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 me question, right? Me me consciousness into really public spirited citizens who 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 are engaging in this we mode, we thinking. You know, how can we have a lot of problems, right? You know, now we are dealing with the pandemic. Right, and then we have a lot of public problems uh, that facing all of us, not only me and you, but all of us. Then, then from our own individual perspective, we have uh, my single problem, my my problem, my family's problem. But then, when we are trying to uh, come up with uh, uh, some sort of solution that affects all of us, so that is uh, coalescing to uh, public policy or law, then we need to think about how 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 can we approach it, this particular issue from perspective of us, right? Then, you know, the most important political education, and I believe, is to help students, young children, to, to understand what it means to belong to this, uh, as you rightly know, sphere that is public, right? Not only my, I mean, private station, private space is extremely important because this is where you can be safe, free from external threat or, 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 or uh, you know, the the censorship and you can you can freely engage in your own critical rational thinking but at the same time you should be able to get out of your own private thinking and see things uh, from the perspective of us so that we can we can come up with collective resolution based on our collective will to move us forward toward the the common good. Again, the challenge, of course, is that we are living in a pluralistic society, right? In a, by religion, by faith, religion, interests, and opinions, and values, and, and all kinds of backgrounds, we are divided. So the art of creating this collective will, uh, which should be provisionalized, it cannot be eternal, and then nobody can top down decide, determine what should be, what should I, our collective will or common good consist of, but then still, we should develop this art of uh, creating uh, this collective will so that when we are facing with the, the problems that are commonly affecting us, then we, we can resolve it together. So I think this is a, one of the most important things for us to for us teachers to to teach our children, especially in this uh, post to, you know, consumerist uh, and, and, you know, the kind of world where we are much more preoccupied with our individual private issues. Yeah, thank you. I think I think uh, I think you point out rightly. We we are no matter whether we are in Hong Kong, Korea, or Singapore, or you know England. You know we live in increasingly diverse, uh, multicultural societies. So it's a, it's also about how we, uh, expose our students to diverse different value systems as well. Um, and and one of the issues is also how we engage them in deliberation, in critical deliberation. Um, because so much of the social media talk is actually very um, corrosive and, and, and negative. So I think these are very good points, um, developing that criticality even from a young age. I'm going to turn now to, to uh, some questions um, that any one of you can answer, any one of the speakers can answer. We have uh, a few questions, so let me start with the first one. Uh, how do we teach in a system and maybe this applies to more East Asian countries, right? How do we teach in a system that's so used to having the right answers? How do we teach ethics in a system where two different moral agents facing the same situations can react in different moral ways? Yeah, does anyone, would anyone like to address that? 
Maybe I start. Prof Tan, yes. I would think that uh, the first thing is to help everyone, and by everyone, I mean the teachers, the students, to know that sometimes um, there are a few right answers. Yeah. So like what the, the person mentioned, uh, different but morally right answers. So for from the perspective of a chinzi, there is no one right answer all the time. It, it depends. Many, many factors. Who is involved? Uh, what is agenda? What is the context? What is the objective, etc.? Who are affected? Who will benefit? And all this, which is what real life is about. So these are life skills that we need to prepare students for. Uh, so I think the start first step would be, yes, I think we did need to dismantle the idea that for some situations, not all, there may not be one right, correct answer all the time. That's number one. Uh, and number two, I would say that Confucius emphasized a lot on role modeling. So what, what is the right answer for a jinzi would depend on how the jinzi conducts himself or herself in everyday life. And the best way is not to learn from textbooks, is to have a role model. And who are the best role models for, for children? Hopefully at home, the parents. But if not, then schools. I think parents and principals play a very, very big part to role model that there's an adult figure for them to look up to, um, to and and Confucius emphasizes a lot on dialogic learning. That means you learn through dialogue. So have a conversation, talk to them, and it's immersion in real life and all that. Because that is a from the Confu Confucian perspective, that is how you you uh, learn and practice and 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 develop the the virtues of a chimps. Yeah. I think this is great. Uh, it kind of uh, links to one of the questions someone asked that's related. The, I think, uh, Professor Arthur, you also mentioned this about parents and the home, you know, being that uh, kind of character educator. Um, this question is about, you know, a lot of our young uh, come from now disintegrated families, disengaged families, families that may not even care about ethics. And in fact, who has become their, their role model now is the, is the media. They are learning a lot of values and negative values from social media rather than from their homes. So, um, you know, what advice do you have for you parents, you know, and how do children, uh, how can children in this kind of context develop ethics from homes, um, you know, when, when their homes may not be, uh, with their homes may be disintegrated? Any thoughts on that? Well, we, um, we established a school at the University of Birmingham. We have a, a, a University of Birmingham school dedicated to character. It specializes in developing the character of the children in that school. That school is now the most popular school in the city. So everyone wants to send their children to this school. Uh, and it's a comprehensive school. It's not a selective academic school, it's a comprehensive school. We know that many parents who come, who send their children to that school may care little for ethics, but they do care a lot for their children. They actually want their children to be better than they are. So even when children come from dysfunctional homes or disorganized homes, the parents usually want their children to be better than what they can provide themselves. So when the school has a good relationship with the parents and works with the parents, then the school can do a great deal to compensate for the problems in the family. I really believe that the teachers, you know, uh, are sort of, I sometimes call it the second line of defense, that they can help where parents are not perhaps capable or don't have the capacity, um, you know, single parents, dysfunctional families, there are many problems in families today, but I still believe that we should emphasize that parents are the first educators and the first that they are responsible for their children. We can't have a situation where teachers are completely responsible for the character of the children in their schools. They have a responsibility, of course, but they they don't have the prime responsibility. They, the state should always make sure that the parents are the most important uh, people. And when the parents are not able to perform that function, then teachers can stand in and help a great deal. So I think the teachers um, are, are, are there. But there are many 
many examples in our culture where the media, the, the culture, this is why it's almost impossible to, to indoctrinate in our societies and Western and sort of uh, Singapore and various other societies. Because you'd have to take children, you'd have to isolate them completely from every influence, from the media, from, from their family, from everything else to indoctrinate. And that's not possible. So I don't think indoctrination is a, is a big issue here. And virtue ethics doesn't produce doctrines and say, you must do this. That's about rules. You know, the state can have its laws and it can schools can have rules that children have to follow. And that's a good thing. But um, ultimately, um, children and students have to make a decision for themselves. And they do that within community. They do it with, with other people. And I think that there is something to do with collective wisdom. Yeah. You know, wisdom that's been handed down from tradition, wisdom that's you know, we create ourselves through reflection, through thinking about things. And we sometimes, we have to do the right thing for the right reasons at the right time. This is what Aristotle would say. And I'm sure Confucius would have said the same as well. He probably did. Yeah, and I think- uh, Can I, I, yeah. can I add one, one comment? Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, but one thing I would like to point out is that we tend to believe a character is independent variable, or it, it has its own intrinsic word or value. I mean, as if a character is kind of mysterious concept that, that speaks for itself. But in fact, depending on who you are, depending on which society you belong to, I mean, we, you know, we, have, we, are, we are living in a world which is very polarized. I mean, Western side of the world on the one end, the democracy, liberal democracy on the one end, and communist Chinese uh, you know, world on the other. And then we, we see the emerging you know, fights and, and contestations amongst the, the civilizations, but depending on what kind of a public value or public morality we want to promote, what kind of, a, what you know, look, we want to educate our kids in liberal democratic values. We want our kids in common property values. What kind of values that, that we have as overarching framework, that's going to influence profoundly what kind of character we want to build in our students and our children, because Again, character is not just like merit. What is merit? You know, please provide us a context in which we can define what merit is in our given context, something like that. So we should be able to, teachers and policymakers should be able to provide uh, us, the citizens, with a clear idea of what it means to be member of our society, what kind of public morality we want to promote. Only if we have that idea, more or less, uh, uh, agreed upon, then we can uh, try to inculcate our kids in so certain type of virtue that can bring them into toward a certain type of character that we want to, uh, you know, bring about for them. So I think this connection between our, I'm going back to, you know, James' earlier presentation, you know, the political environment to our society on the one end, our individual ethics on the other, these are mutually connected. And of course, all these intermediary uh, institutions in our civil society from family to, you know, townships and then of course the schools and, and religious institutions, these are playing important intermediate roles, but still as long as we belong to one overarching political community as we citizens, then I think it's important for us to have a, a common political public morality. Professor Kim, I agree with you, but everything I said is based on the assumption that we have freedom, that there is a freedom and that civil society is free to create these structures. So everything that I've said assumes a level of freedom in society and a freedom of the individual within community. If that freedom doesn't exist, then character is going to be very difficult to, to, to flower, to flourish. I agree. I agree. Sure. I think that that's a good point. I mean, when I think about Singapore as well, um, there has been a, a, in recent years a big push um, for teachers, for all teachers to infuse character education in their disciplines. And I think, um, you know, the question is, do teachers themselves feel confident and comfortable in discussing even contemporary and even controversial issues in the classroom when, um, you know, before maybe they did not feel they had that freedom to do so. So, I think, I think that's important, not just for students to have that space for deliberation, but for teachers as well to model uh, spaces for this kind of discussion. 
Um, so I think this is great. Um, unfortunately, the time has run out. We have very good questions here, um, but we've reached six. So I want to be respectful of everyone's time and it's coming to dinner in, in Singapore. So I'm going to turn over the time to Dennis. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, that's the end of today's session. Thanks for sticking with us. And it has been um, hopefully quite insightful and enlightening for everybody. Uh, please bear with us for a little while longer. We've got a QR code coming up on the screen uh, that leads to a feedback form. Uh, your feedback is important to us and will help us to organize future Imagining Educational Futures webinar. So please do spare a minute uh, or so to fill in the form. I would like to end with Charlene's questions as we head into the weekend. What sort of person should I be this weekend and as we live? And with that, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for those of us, uh, wherever in the world you may be. Thank you.